Hello, and welcome to On The Marie Curie Couch, the podcast that aims to break down taboos and start open, honest conversations about death and dying. I'm Jason Davidson. I'm a social worker by profession, and I've worked in palliative care, hospice care, and bereavement support services for more than a decade. Each episode, we'll be speaking to a well-known guest to find out about how they feel about their own mortality and how their personal experience of bereavement has shaped the way they live their life. Today, I'm on the Marie Curie couch with Marlon Anderson. Marlon is a makeup artist and reality star and is best known for appearing on the second series of ITV2's Love Island, where islanders compete to find love and win a cash prize. Since leaving the Love Island Villa in 2016, Marlon's been a vocal supporter of causes that have touched her life, including body positivity, the fight against domestic abuse, and paid leave for bereaved parents. Well, Marlon Anderson, welcome to the Marie Curie Couch. Thank you for having me on. Marlon, if it's okay with you, I'd like to start today by asking if you could tell us about a significant bereavement that you've experienced in your life. Yeah, um, I've had a few in my life, but I'd probably start off with my mum. I think when she passed away around four years ago, I was only 25 and I think that hit me like a ton of bricks because my dad passed away when I was younger, when I was a baby. So I don't remember him as much. And he wasn't obviously in my life. So my mom had two roles in her life. So when she left me, that actually really shook, shook my kind of world and turned it upside down because that's all I knew, you know? Mm-hmm. So I'd, yeah, I'd have to go with my mum. Can you tell us about your mum's illness? Was she ill for a while? Was it a sudden death? Yes. Yeah, so my mum had, uh, she was diagnosed with breast cancer when I was around seven, eight years old. She was her 50th birthday. She had the letter through the post coming for us, you know, a breast scan. And um, she had turned out she had breast cancer. It was very aggressive. I think it was stage, stage two, stage, I think it was stage two. And um, she had, she had the lump removed and she's, she was on medication for around, you know, 15 years. Um, she had glands removed from her arm, so she couldn't really work as, as well as she used to. So she was ill pretty much my whole childhood. She was in and out of hospital, stuff like that. Um, went for checkups constantly, but she was clear. And then it was actually post Love Island, I came out and um, they had diagnosed her with breast cancer in her other breast, which was surprising actually. Um, So she had it removed. um, And actually the whole time, while she was going through chemotherapy for that and, and radiotherapy, she actually had stomach cancer and it was stage three and it spread and she only had around three months to live. So we, it was quite a shock for us all as a family because we were thinking, you know, the breast has been, has been removed. She, she's done it before she can do it again. And actually this whole time she, you know, she was struggling with her eating and we were, you know, it was being part off as IBS and, and other things from the doctors. So um, it was that. And so I watched her die a quick but slow death in terms of starvation. I was there every day, every minute with her. And I just saw what I thought was my mum turn into someone that I didn't really know, you know? And it, that, I think the struggle and the suffering that I saw her go through was pretty traumatic for me. So yeah, it was, it was, a, it was a very weird experience. I don't think I've, well, I haven't experienced anything like that in my life. Was your mum at home? Yeah, she was at the hospice, but we decided to bring her out of the hospice and have her in the comfort, you know, of our living room. And we were all sleeping downstairs with a mattress pet, pro- like propped up on the floor and, I think um, it was her final week and it was very weird. You know, I think each day she'd lose a part of herself. Um, Her hearing was obviously the last thing to go, but she became delusional. If you think about it, you know, she couldn't eat, she couldn't keep anything in at all. And she was on morphine, high high medication and she became delirious and it actually became quite scary for me. It it was, it was very hard to see. Um, And she, she was just lost so much weight she became super, super skinny and just looked as ill as she was, which isn't nice because sometimes, you know, when people pass away, they don't look as ill as what they they actually are, but you could see it in my mom. And I think having that image 
isn't isn't good at all I had I have yeah I have quite a lot of images of her in her final days in my head instead of trying to remember the happy times but yeah well it's hard to replace those images with those memories of the happy times because actually you know those images as you've described can be really traumatic to watch and to witness and to see and you know seeing your mum as you say physically changing so dramatically as well and that's really painful yeah it was actually it would have been a 69th birthday yesterday and I posted a photo of her smiling and stuff and that and you know that was nice to see but it was also sad because I announced my pregnancy and it would you know you'd want your mum there for that you'd want your parent in your life and it's actually strange because you know we go through giving birth we go through life we go through death and actually my mum's final day she became almost like a toddler again I was caring for her I was actually a sole carer I was bathing her cleaning her wiping her and they become so fragile and vulnerable and it's almost like at the end of their life they become what they were at the beginning of their life and it's such a weird cycle and process but I'm actually quite fascinated by it you know it's it's just a, it's a circle of life and I think I had to understand that um and I understand death a lot more than what my friends would be, you know, because they haven't experienced certain things that I've seen. And I have to look at things very differently from a different perspective to get my head around certain situations. Can you tell us a bit more about that, about that different perspective? Yeah, right. I'm just a huge believer in, you know, we, we all have to die at some point and that when our time comes, it comes. And my mum needed to pass away for me to understand life differently. As soon as she died, I changed. I became a better person. I became independent. I, it was almost like the universe had shaken, shaken me up and was like, right, Marlon, get yourself together and let's, let's conquer your life. Because I was very reliant on her. I took her for granted, as you do. You know, I was a horrible teen, um, very bratty. And, and, you know, she, she did a lot for me. And I think once you lose someone, it's only then that you can appreciate when they were here. But my whole life completely changed. And I grew up and, and I just saw a different perspective on everything you know I, I live life very differently now I am very spontaneous <laughs> I live life like it's you know my last day tomorrow and I don't take anything too seriously I just try and keep a really positive attitude and and in fact you know you some people go a different way when they lose someone they can go down the wrong route don't get me wrong I did for a little bit a few months after she died I was trying to drink I was trying to numb the pain there are different coping mechanisms of grief you know and I went through different stages but Ultimately, I lost my little girl as well, not long after my mum. So I think that was a turning point for me when I, when I saw life with like a HD lens and I thought, okay, there's a reason I'm still alive and that I've managed to get through this, this trauma. Let's, let's do something, let's do something with it. And so I turned all my pain into purpose and that gave me a reason to spur on and kind of live, if you say, because there were times I didn't want to live, I'll be honest. <laughs> and I just heard you say there, Marlon, that you're... Was it your daughter who also yeah. died? And that was not long after your mum? No, that was literally under a year. And I named her after my mum as well, which was ironic. <laughs> I laugh about it, but it's just, you know, like, well, okay. <laughs> What's the universe trying to tell me here? But yeah, that was different. It was strange because obviously I carried a child in me for, for, for seven to eight months, gave birth, had her alive for a month, saw her you know, and I didn't bond with her. She didn't have a personality. So it was different to grieving over my mum because I had a lifetime with my mum. Well, not a lifetime, a quarter of my lifetime with my mum, but she had no personality yet. It felt very different. It was, I felt like life had been cruel to me because I just thought, what is going on? I just want to be happy. And I kept questioning what my existence was on, on earth. You know, like, what, what's the point of me being here if all I'm going to get is suffering? And I was dealing with an abusive relationship with my daughter's father as well. And he had gone to jail about a year after and managed to get in sentence. But it was a very difficult time for me. And I think I didn't allow myself to grieve because of what was going on with him. And it was only the past year I actually grieved for my daughter properly during lockdown when I had space and time to myself to think. And you have time. Because I think with grief, a lot of people try and numb the pain out. They try and push it to one side, but ultimately it will always spiral back and come back onto you. And you need to deal with it there and then. And um, so I had therapy, my life kind of changed. I, I meditate every morning. I found things that give me a lot of peace and harmony. I do yoga. I try and exercise. I try and eat a balanced diet. 
and I try and surround myself with really good people because I know that if if I didn't I'd go the opposite way and so yeah just trying to keep that good positive mental attitude is, is how I've got through everything really. Before you embraced some of those things that sound really really helpful um you know that you've just described like yoga and meditation and um you know what what do you think was was getting you through those times when your mum had died and your daughter died within a year i don't actually know if i i would love to tell you that i knew what that was but there must be something inside of me some sort of strength that i had inside myself because I got up every morning, even though some days I didn't want to. And I actually can't even tell you what that was. It was like, I had little angels whispering in my ear, like, come on, there's a, there's a reason why you're here and there's gonna be good things that come to you. But it was just a drive that I had inside of me. And I knew that if my mum was alive and my little girl was alive, they'd be wanting me to, to get on, you know, to, to push through. And that's probably the only reason because I thought it would be very selfish of me not to because of what's happened to them. You know, innocent lives taken out of my control. Why would I want to do that, you know? So I think I looked at it from that kind of perspective. Mm -hmm. Just going back to um, when your mum was, or when you were all as a family told that your mum's illness was terminal and that she was gonna die. Um, did, did, you, did you have conversations about death and dying? I mean, was your mum open about that? Were you, was anybody around you? I didn't really have conversations with anyone. I think I was in denial for a very long time. I didn't understand what was happening to me or her. I didn't really get the process. My mum kind of knew. She just, you know, she was a very strong woman. She fought right up until the very end. But when you know that you're going to die, you take, you just accept it. And so she would try and take humor from it and still make jokes <laughs> and things like that. And I was, I think I had some sort of weird hope that she would survive even on, in her very final days. But the more I saw her lose her mind and her, you know, and her senses, it became very real. And all I did was kind of, all I did was pray, funnily enough. I just, I think I just, wanted to make I, I don't actually know what I did it, it's very weird because I was there comforting her waiting for her to die basically and I was googling all sorts of things what how does a person die how does their last breath look like you know what what are the signs and symptoms and because I just wanted to make sure I captured everything in my head and I actually watched her take her final breath so yeah it's death is a very strange thing no one talks about it no one educates you at school on it. <laughs> I didn't have a Scooby-Doo what was going on to me. Um, but it's something that is part of life. You know, it's inevitable. It's, everyone's going to die. But I think it needs to be spoken about more, especially to younger kids, because there are kids that lose both their parents at a young age and become orphans or they lose one parent and they don't understand it because none of their friends have gone through it. So who are they going to speak to? So I think there's a lot of education that needs to be done around it. Absolutely. And as you just described, I think getting that, you know, informing yourself. So what you were doing there was you were trying to find the information yourself whilst living the experience, you know, of watching your mum die to see what it was like. And it's so, you know, we, we have, um, we've got a video on our website um, and it's, it's one of, one of our kind of nurses who just explain the process of death. And of course, it's not always the same for everybody, but actually just what often happens at the end of life when someone's dying right up until they take the last breath and then afterwards and um, and she explains that in such a clear way and actually you know it's something that um, I think it's been on there maybe over a year but it's something that is really well used as well you know people are watching it um, because I think it is important isn't it to to sort of begin to get a sense of what to expect. Can you, can you tell us, Marlon, um, about, about your mum's actual death, about those last moments? Yeah, it was, she died at 2.25 in the morning. I was downstairs and the, the night before, she had blood in her tube, which was very strange. There was like dark, dark brown fluid in her tube going up to her nose where she would be feeding. And I thought that was strange, you know, and she, she kind of just, she was breathing, but, there was nothing else to her. She wasn't communicating, she wasn't responding. 
she was you know unconscious just lying there essentially but still breathing and I, I had some weird sense in my body and so at night time I just didn't sleep I just stayed with her and I got everyone and we could tell it was strange her breathing was sporadic it was slow quick stops for a bit comes back and then yeah and then and that's strange in itself yeah yeah definitely and I was I was just holding her hand and you know I, I think I had I, I was I'm a, I'm a weird person I had I think I was sprink, sprinkling glitter on her because I had this little prayer box and I'd written her a note and I'd popped it in and poor mum's dying she's got glitter all over her <laughs> but I was reading her poems I think we were listening to some of her favorite music it was very quiet my family we were very loud and we love an argument and you know what sisters and brothers are like but everybody had nothing to say at this point and my stepdad he was reading psalms out of the bible I could hear him upstairs he didn't want to be downstairs and um and then I was holding her hand and she took her last breath and her body just went into rigor mortis and it was the weirdest thing I just her hand just went stiff and it, I just I freaked out and I was like oh my god and then I just ran upstairs and me and my sister lied she my sister came into bed with me and we we just shut our eyes because we didn't really know what to do it was very very strange and we could hear the doctors come through to take her body. Her body was downstairs in the living room for a while, actually. And my stepdad was with my mum downstairs. And I think that's when he had his moment with her when she was on her own. But we, for some reason, me and my siblings, we went for food that day because we didn't know what to do. We were so lost. When I described the feeling of being lost, it was so much confusion. Like, what do we do today? Like, what, where do I go? What do I, we went for food and I remember just feeling really out of it. My head was away in the clouds and I don't think it had sunk in. And when it did sink in, I think anger took over and I became very angry at life. I became angry at why, why me? Why did that happen to my mum? Why is she gone? And when someone is removed from your life like that, it's a part of yourself that's been removed. So I felt so lost and I didn't have the best support around me, if I'm going to be honest. I didn't have the best friends around me. You know, I didn't really have anyone that I could speak to. It would, it would just be my siblings that kind of understood in a way. But we all dealt with grief very differently as well. But looking back, I did a lot on my own and I got through a lot on my own. I would just go for walks. I think I went for a walk the day after she died and it was snowing. And I think I wrote her name in the snow. Like I, I just did things that would try and give me peace. But yeah, it was a very, very blurry time of my life. <laughs> very blurry time of my life. This September, Swimathon is back and better than ever. Swim at any time on any day between Friday the 3rd of September and Sunday the 19th of September at any venue of your choosing. Swimathon is designed to suit all levels of fitness. From 400 metres to 30.9 kilometres, there's a challenge to suit you. Visit swimathon.org to find out more. A blurry time. Yeah. But actually it also sounds like a time when you were still able to do the things that were important to you. I think when you were describing, you know, sprinkling glitter and the reading of poetry and the box, um, it sounds really beautiful, Marlon. And I, I know that when, you know, right at the end, um, you know, when your mum's hands, as you showed me, you know, went stiff and that's really strange. And um, I think, you know, what you've described about the day after and kind of just... And, and, and not just day, I mean, we, we hear from people, you know, in our organisation, but it's, it can be days and weeks where people feel just quite robotic and not, not knowing what to do and kind of almost separate from the world. Yeah, I felt very separate. I felt like I wanted to scream and shout and tell everybody that my mum had just died. It was so bizarre. And I tried, I wanted to get messages from my mum. I wanted some sort of sign that she was around me still. And I was journaling all my dreams, trying to see if there were messages in my dreams. I, I could feel her presence around me. It was very strange. I started seeing lots of white feathers, butterflies, you know, um, but I became very scared at night um, and felt very like alone. Mm. I think the, the term alone, you could be surrounded by people, but still feel alone because, because of that. And I think that it took me a long time to to build myself back up after that. And I think becoming pregnant shortly after gave me a new sense of purpose and meaning. And so when my daughter passed away, 
it was just, I just, nothing made sense to me then. <laughs> Because you try and think that, you know, we, as humans, we like control. We like to figure out that we've got our life in order. So when, when life takes us, when the universe, you know, does its thing and takes away people from your life and, you know, natural, natural things like someone dying and you, you realize then that you don't actually have control over say, certain situations. And then sometimes you should just let go and let go of that resistance and just let it be. And what will be, will be. And I think that's important too, because... We get so obsessed with this journey and making everything perfect and, and, you know, wasting so much time on other people and negative things and being consumed by what other people think. And, you know, the pointless things. And when someone does die, you realize that none of that matters, essentially. Looking after yourself matters and, and taking care of yourself does matter. Um, and everything else becomes irrelevant. And I think that's the perspective I've been given from everything. What was your mum and, and then daughter's name? Conce. So my mum was called Conce, and then Yana and my daughter Conce. <laughs> Can you tell us a bit about Conce, your mum? It's just yeah, she was she was a Sri Lankan lady. Um, she was born in Sri Lanka. She was actually a nun. She moved to Sweden and met my dad. Yeah, she lived. She yeah, she fell in love with my dad, and she had four kids. And my mum, bless her, my dad passed away when I was a year old with skin cancer, and he had that three times. So I was still a newborn. My dad had died, and my mum became very depressed, you know, she wanted to start a new life. She moved to England to get away from everything. And essentially she raised four kids on her own. And, and she was a strong, strong lady, but I could tell now looking back, she was very sad a lot of her life because she missed my dad, you know, and, and then she became ill. So I think she didn't live the best life. If I'm, if I'm, but I think her kids gave her her happiness. Me and my siblings gave her that life that she wanted. And so I know that her passing away was an end to her suffering, essentially. So, yeah. Can you tell us about your mum's funeral? Yeah, it was a church service. She got cremated. Um, I actually went to see her body. I got a bit weird because I got a bit obsessed with looking at her body. You know, when you're just fascinated and with the embalming and whatnot. And I looked at it, but it didn't look like her. And then, yeah, I mean, just to normal funeral well it wasn't a normal funeral service we just it, it was a bit of a blur that day church service then the cremation and then I think I just got drunk <laughs> and it went quite quickly but it was after the funeral service it's when your friends and people around you think it's done and then you're left to deal with the grief because you know a funeral means end of it done but in your head it's like what <laughs> what's going on there's no closure there's never any closure I know you've touched on this already. What was your experience of grief like after your mum died? Um, very sporadic. It was a, there was a lot of anger. Very random. I'd be crying some nights, most nights, and then it, then I'd stop. But then there'd be something that would trigger me, or a memory, or seeing something, a reminder, and yeah, it just it, it's on it's on and off. There's moments I, I want my mum now. And so grief will never get easier. There's just different ways of dealing with it. And yeah, she has memorabilia that I look at sometimes, you know, a little memory box I have for her. But also it's good to grieve and think of them, but I also have to move on and live my life. And sometimes, you know, and this is just a fine balance, isn't it really? Describe some of those things that have helped you in your grief. So um, those things about, um, you know, like sort of yoga and meditation and looking after yourself. Um, was there anything else that particularly helped you, Marlon, with your experience of ongoing experience of bereavement and grief? Yeah, journaling, journaling my thoughts, my feelings, what was on my mind, what was going on, um, listening to, you know, motivational podcasts reading self-help books. Um, I became very spiritual. So, you know, making sure my surroundings were very calm and zen, so lighting incense every morning, playing piano music, having my crystals around me, different bits of crystals, um, the meditation, trying to zone out sometimes and just, just trying to create as much peace in my life and removing anything that wasn't like, wasn't good or healthy for me. 
exercise. I've always been a bit lazy, but trying to trying to keep up with exercise, you know, running, walking, fresh air, nature has helped massively for me. I actually love bird watching for some reason. I just birds fascinate me. Since my mum died, I would always see doves, white doves would come and fly around me. And traveling helped me quite a bit too. But ultimately, I think allowing yourself to grieve helped me and not trying to block anything out. So when feelings would come and I wanted to cry, I would let myself be like that. I wouldn't be trying to be strong because that's not being strong. That's just being silly. (laughs) Was your mum a spiritual woman? Yeah, she was very spiritual. She was more spiritual in a a religious sort of way. She was Christian. Um, Whereas me is, is more about the power of the mind, you know, and law of attraction and manifesting positivity into your life and uh, angels and energy and so it's nice in a way because I can lean back on that and it makes me feel like I'm closer with her and that there's a reason for everything so I think that message as well that you you know one of the one of the aims of this podcast there's 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 a few but one of the aims of the podcast is to um you know what what we've heard back from listeners is that when they're grieving themselves or they're caring for somebody who's dying um then actually listening to other people's experiences is really helpful and I think that message of you know that you just described of searching uh, creating peace and trying to stay away from things that are unhealthy for you. I think that's a really strong, helpful message, you know, for people to hear, Um, because you need peace um, as well, don't you? You know, especially when you are grieving, to be able to manage it and get through it and and experience it. Yeah, definitely. Um, You know, we're we're human at the end of the day. What would be easy to turn to a bottle of wine and try and, you know, get rid of your feelings that way or pick up a book. At the end of the day, we don't want to feel, we're, we're human. We don't want to feel pain. Pain doesn't feel nice. Pain is uncomfortable. Change is uncomfortable. But essentially in order to grow, we need to go through that change and feel uncomfortable. And I, I always say my favorite quote is without struggle, there is no progress. And all the struggle in my life has led me to this very moment. And I'm a much better person, I'm a much stronger person, but essentially, I, I have grown with it all and I am who I am today because of everything, but I also need to understand that nothing, none of what has happened to me is defines me either as a person. I can't keep, you know, I don't become a victim to what's happened or a victim to my past. I allow myself to move forward and enjoy life and be very present and be very mindful and focus on the now instead of going back to where the pain was. I enjoy talking about it because it's raising the awareness, but I also have to separate myself from doing that too. So I have my time because I have my social media can get very, you know, get a lot because I'm always talking about these different experiences that I've gone through in order to help others, but I have to also look after myself. So I, there's a good, there's a good balance. So I think balance for everybody is key. <laughs> Absolutely. Like I said, Marlon, we've got, um, we've got a few aims with this podcast. One of the other ones is to encourage people to have conversations about death and dying, because what we know is when people talk about death and dying and plan for it and think about planning for the future, then, you know, they, they can have a different experience at the end and whether that's somebody who's dying themselves or those around them. And I want to ask you whether you ever think about your own death. Yeah, funnily enough, I'm not scared of death at all. I'm actually fascinated by it and I'm a huge believer that the life that I'm living now is actually a test and it's it's not very fun at all. And when I do die, that will be when the fun begins in my head, you know, everything will be bliss and nice and lovely. <laughs> and so I don't fear much at all. I think because I feared the worst and the worst has already happened. I have nothing yet. I have nothing left to fear. Um, I just live life right now in each moment and I will not let anyone take any kind of happiness that I have away from me. And, and when I do die, that's my time. And yeah, it'd be interesting to find out how I die, but I will never know because I'll be dead. But yeah, I mean, it is what it is. <laughs> and on a practical level, have you thought about things like writing a will or writing down funeral wishes or any wishes you might want for your care at the end of life? No, not at all. I haven't even thought about it. No, 
don't need to plan that yet. <laughs> no, just taking each day as it comes and um, just create good thoughts in my mind. So I have a good kind of reality around me. As I say, you know, good thoughts lead to good reality. So yeah, not even thinking about that. <laughs> yeah, and lots of people don't. I mean, that's not, you know, it's not uncommon. And you're, you know, a young woman and you know, why would we need to be thinking about our death? But actually, I suppose one of the messages um, we like to talk about is, especially with some of those practical things, um, that can be really helpful. And actually, it might just take a few hours one afternoon to be able to sort out kind of writing a will, um, you know, and, and even in even in our wills, we can include, and I'm saying this for the listeners, um, you know, even in our will, we can include basic funeral wishes as well. So something like, whether we want to be buried or cremated because of course often people will say well I've had those conversations with my family or oh, I'm not bothered and whatever they want to do at the end they can do um, but actually what we do see is at times of grief when somebody has died then people are saying oh well what did he want and um, what would you want and um so so we we do encourage people to do some of those more practical things um around planning for the future yeah before we finish, Marlon, today, I've got a couple of questions. Is legacy something that's important to you? So how you'd like to be remembered? Oh, a million percent. Um, with me, myself, I'd like to be remembered for things I've done. Action, I guess, and trying to create a better world somehow, even if it's touched one person's life, you know, creating change in a positive way and trying to take a stance on things that, aren't spoken about and things that need to be changed. So I think, yeah, definitely creating change would be hopeful, hopefully my legacy and, and just doing something different, you know? If you had any words or thoughts or a message to share with listeners who might be caring for a loved one now who's dying or is grieving, what might you say? To be very mindful, to be very present, to feel your surroundings right now and to try not to look at the past and what's happened and any regret and try not to look into the future and to what your life will be like without this person but to focus on the very now and by doing so sometimes I kind of feel my hands try and get my senses working and breathe deeply get my breathing on point and listen to the sounds around me to get myself very really grounded and present because that moment only comes right now and you'll never get that back so and finally, what's it meant to you today, Marlon, to come on the Marie Curie couch? Oh, it's meant a lot. And as I say, it gives me another platform to raise awareness on things that are very close to my heart. And as you said, creating conversation around the topic of grief is something that needs to be done. And I, I really applaud you guys. And I, I appreciate you having me on because my voice can help other people and it will reach people that I've never reached before. So, yeah, it's, it's fab. Well, thank you so much for sharing your mum and your daughters, a bit of their stories, and for being so open and honest and joining us on the Marie Curie couch today. And Marlon, I've no doubt that, you know, this episode will be a real inspiration for many people. Thanks again. My pleasure, thank you for having me. So that's all for this episode of On the Marie Curie Couch. We hope it's got you thinking about matters of life and death and perhaps starting those conversations with your own friends and family. Marie Curie's here to help. From planning ahead to coping with bereavement, you can talk through any concerns you have around the end of life with our support line team, which also includes specially trained nurses. Call us on 0800 080 2309 or search Marie Curie online. This podcast is produced and edited by Marie Curie with support from Ultimate Sound and Vision. The music featured is Time Lapse by Pan Oceanic. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please do like and subscribe. Thanks for listening and until next time, goodbye.